The two-day Tasmania Super Sprint has seen Erebus take charge in the title race, furthering their lead in both championships across the chaotic weekend. The three short races saw a flurry of battles and some of our heavy hitters taking big shunts. Let's cover it all with some instant gratification. The racing at Simmons Plains is usually wild, the short and tight circuit leaving little room for error and the tight hairpin usually leading to interesting and diverse racing. This weekend was of course no different, with three exciting races continuing to drive home the point that Gen 3 was designed for close quarters racing. All three races went without a safety car this weekend, but were generally exciting to the last lap with multiple drivers in contention for podiums across the weekend. My compliments, however, are slightly withdrawn for two reasons. Firstly, the P word. I don't want to dwell on it too much, but this should have been sorted out by now. Um, I'll mention it in a future video that's coming out this week, but it just ruins what is good racing this weekend, you know? My other issue, however, was the sheer volume of sloppy racing that we had this weekend, furthered by the lack of repercussions for said sloppy racing. Multiple times this weekend we saw two or more drivers getting into biffs with each other, some race ending incidents and some forcing drivers to lose time due to their recovery and their repairs. This befell both of our championship protagonists Shane Van Gisbergen and Brody Kostecki, both being struck in separate races with Shane having to retire and Brody being laps off of the lead in his race. These sorts of incidents, they're not uncommon in racing, and especially not around here, but the weird thing is just the complete lack of penalties or discussion, you know, of repercussions being dealt out across the weekend. The only driver to actually receive a penalty for their poor driving this weekend was Declan Fraser in what I consider to be perhaps the least worst incident of the lot. And I don't want penalties to be flying across the weekend, I don't want every incident to have a penalty, but there does need to be a line drawn, especially when you force another car to DNF and you're at majority fault. Crashing into someone in qualifying and practice as well, that's something that really should be considered getting penalties for, especially if you're doing it twice in the one day. And what we saw this weekend wasn't your little argy-bargy, wasn't your SVG love taps out of the hairpin, it was big time costly shunts, it was expensive and time, grid, and points penalties are all available, and you can use post-race investigations when possible to get driver input. It's not like there aren't options to stop this sort of racing. Look, my point is, you can't spin Jack Smith like this and not expect to get any penalties. Someone has some explaining to do, because I am furious, and I'm coming. Otherwise, this weekend, the racing was pretty good. These cars are proving they can race close and allow for good overtaking. There was lots of pack racing, lots of going side by side, especially out of the hairpin, and you can follow under the rear bumpers through a lot more of these corners a lot better. It's the sort of stuff that was promised with Gen 3, and I'm glad to see it's delivering, and I'm actually really curious as how it will play out at Darwin, and even later on into the year at Sandown and Bathurst. The undercard we had this weekend was also very exciting. The Porsches, I mean, you can't go wrong with a Porsche race. Usually they're entertaining. We got to see the junior Formula Fords alongside the main game supercars, which was very nice, very good for the young drivers in that series. We also had the Tasmanian Tin Tops, which were a fan favorite across COVID when we had very little side support action where we just grabbed whatever we could and chucked them in the races at Tasmania and Townsville. And as well as that, the Aussie racing cars, they go hard wherever they go. I'm glad to see them. I want to see them more often. Every time I see an Aussie racing car race, I think about buying an Aussie racing car. That's how damn good they are. One discussion point that comes up every time they come back to Tasmania is, are these cars too big for the track? You see it in qualifying and practice, there's just too many cars clamoring over each other and it nearly caused quite a big incident with James Courtney. It's not only here as well, it's also Perth, and my thoughts on it are, they're the best drivers in Australia, aren't they? They can work it out. 
Like I get the idea of splitting up the qualifying. Sure, that's a great idea, but they are also supposed to be sort of the premier drivers of Australia that are in tin top cars. This isn't a rookie series. They should be able to find that room on track and the team should be able to sort of slot them into a place where they can settle up without running into the cars in front. Whilst I am here and whilst I remember, I also want to bring up supercars sort of technical direction and social media direction. While I was gathering clips for this video and sort of doing a little bit of research just to make sure I had things right, I was watching their video for, I think it was race 11. I'll fact check this in a second. Um, and halfway through the race replay, it sort of just blacks out for a good minute and a half. And it's not just that either. It's multiple things like across the weekend, there was a huge break between two races that was only filled by the tin tops. We're sort of lucky that there was a no ring 24 hours on because I think a lot of people were just watching that between the races. There wasn't much exciting going on. I think that social media is the one spot where supercars really could perform better. If you look at things like F1, the sort of social media game has helped them get more fans as well as Drive to Survive, of course. But the things that are available on the Formula One YouTube page are so much more expansive per race weekend than what's available on the Supercars YouTube page. It's not as accessible. It's not as entertaining. It's not as diverse. Obviously, I'm no expert. Once again, this is just one person's opinion. Um, but I do think Supercars could do better to promote the sport in a way that's sort of interesting to new viewers and sort of gives people more of an understanding of what's going on in the sport. As well as that, there is one thing that I wanted to share that's a positive. I think I think that they should have more of these sort of still camera shots. They are some of the best things in Supercars because you just get to see the relative speed. And I think that's just, just a really nice shot to have sprinkled in here and there. All right, now it's time to move on to our race weekend winners and losers. Now, straight up, I just want to mention our three biggest winners of the weekend. Brown, Kostecki, and Feeney. They've all done well throughout the weekend. Multiple podiums across the board. I don't think I need to say more than that, really, do I? However, in my eyes, the bigger winners of the weekend is the whole Matt Stone Racing team. Multiple times, they qualified in the top 10. They finished in the top 10. Cameron Hill, a rookie, first time racing there. And Jack LeBrock, he's excellent at this track. Clear winners of this weekend. And controversially, Cameron Waters. I know he had his incidents throughout the weekend, but he is really pulling the weight for Ford right now. He's putting his car in places that you wouldn't really expect it, fighting for the podiums and trying to give that Mustang everything that he has. He's a winner in my eyes. Now that we've wrapped up our winners, it's time to move on to our losers. And straight off the bat, Ford. Parity issues aside, the best four drivers right now are clashing with each other and crashing. It's not great. When you see teams like Grove Racing, who have been good throughout the season so far, just down the order and getting involved in sloppy incidents, it's sort of not what you want. And I don't think any Ford driver other than Waters has come out of this weekend looking great. And I'm going to further this point by just mentioning James Courtney and what a shit run of luck he's had. Like, I mean, genuinely shit. He has not had a race weekend where he hasn't had a huge incident. It's not exactly his fault either. I feel for the man. He's just going through a really rough year. And I really hope that his fortunes change at some point. Despite the fact he's been on the podium, Despite the fact he's been fast, this year has certainly been one to forget. And the final loser for this weekend is me. I didn't get to watch a single race live because I double booked myself with work and I missed out on some thrilling action. Thankfully got to watch all on replay, but it's annoying when you miss out on these things. And I also just want to clarify that these rankings aren't meant to be taken too seriously. These guys aren't losers and I don't want it to become something toxic. It's just a bit of fun. It's just 
ranking drivers on where I thought they would have performed over the weekend. Now the next race we head to is Darwin, which is of course the indigenous round, which is one of my favorite rounds because of all the liveries that get revealed. They're so damn good and like my favorite from last year, Jack Smith's livery. I'm hoping that we see something like that, especially on these Gen 3 cars. I cannot wait. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to like, be sure to comment. Absolutely do let me know what your thoughts are. I try to read the comments and respond to everyone possible. I do enjoy hearing what you guys have to say on these races. But that's the end of the video. I'll see you guys later this week when I drop a video about the parody. Until then, I'll catch you next time.